rolling friction is quite sometimes difficult to understand uh, because uh, you may not understand what what if, where is the friction uh, process or energy dissipation so as we discussed last time if you have got a wheel on a road and if the this wheel is the turning wheel that means this is giving the traction to the vehicle so this wheel is being rotated by the whole engine and uh, the automotive system so when this happens because of friction this will push backward but the the wheel will push backward but because of friction there will be a frictional force which will be in this direction so which acts at the hub of this so this is how the there will be motion so because of this friction there is a, a relative motion here there is a slip there will be slip lot of slip happening and therefore there will be lot of sliding happening so this happens for the traction wheel that means the wheel which uh, generates power and that gives power to for the motion but if the wheel is just rotating it is being pulled so there is a force here acting uh, this may be some different force okay and and you have got the road here or the track so in this situation because of the load there is a normal load acting here load of the the vehicle or the wheel um, there will be some plowing action and some deformation either this deformation can be on the track itself or it can be on the the wheel itself okay in either case there is some deformation ahead of the motion and this leads to slippage so there will be again slippage or sliding <clears throat> so sliding is is part of uh, the rolling action even in the in the case of um, ball bearing for example so ball is in the race again here also there will be some deformation and also the speed also will be different slightly different at different points and that leads to the sliding and the elastic hysteresis is because of material so if one of the material is uh, elastomer so in the case of road um, and the the tire the tire is the elastic part is elastomer okay which deforms a lot and therefore there will be a lot of elastic hysteresis you have understood elastic hysteresis which is given as in the stress strain curve this is the loading part and this is the unloading part that means this is the loss loss of energy okay this area represents the loss of energy so which is elastic hysteresis so the more elastic deformation takes place the more elastic hysteresis will happen and therefore there will be more loss of energy any example of you can say you experience elastic hysteresis in the rolling motion sir uh, bicycling during bicycling okay but how do you feel i mean how do you see the difference i mean when you are biking that's the biking you know it takes the energy whatever energy is required but why do you say you you think there is elastic hysteresis because sir uh, with some of the places where uh, i uh, thought uh, the contact area increases we require more uh, force to uh, but why the contact area will increase uh, due to deformation of the road and uh, tires yeah so one thing you must have experienced that when your tire has less air right when the tire has less air then in that case the tire gets flattened much more right and in this case 
there is a much more elastic hysteresis because there is a lot of deformation taking place in the tire. So this is one example and that's why in a bicycle or car, where whatever you are have, <clears throat> the, the pressure in the tire must be optimum. If pressure is less, then it is not an optimum situation and you will spend a lot of energy uh, biking or driving. So you will lose um, fuel in car if the pressure is less. So the tire pressure must be maintained at whatever pressure has been recommended. So this is the big example of elastic hysteresis. And of course, uh, while walking, if you walk on a soft surface um, or rubber or carpet, you will find that you need to do more work than work walking on a hard surface. So that is again elastic hysteresis. And same will happen with the rolling process. In the rolling also, if you are rolling a, a trolley on a carpet, you have to push a lot to uh, make it move. Whereas if you roll it in a hard surface, you don't have to do that much of work. So partial slip is a part of the rolling process. And plowing action will take place if the, there is a lot of deformation of the track against the wheel. And adhesion and dehesion will take place. Uh, adhesion means, of course, when the wheel is just coming in contact, here is the adhesion part, it is coming, and here is the dehesion part. So there is a work to do when there is adhesion, work of adhesion. Okay? So there is a work to do and then dehesion is the reverse of it. So this also has got a lot of energy losses. And addition to that, the hub friction, hub is basically uh, sliding friction. So if this is the wheel and this is the axle, so between the axle surface and the wheels, uh, whatever wheel we have, uh, there will be uh, sliding action here taking place. Either it will take place here or in, for example in a railway, we have got wheel and axle and wheel here. But there will be some bearing here. So the friction will be in the bearing here. Okay. So ultimately there has to be a friction um, to overcome this hub friction part. So all this contributes to the rolling friction. But the good thing is that we can control many of the, these things. We can reduce, minimize and therefore the rolling friction can be reduced to a large extent. Sliding friction is large, but again, sliding friction can also be minimized by proper design and by proper material selection. So these two parts have to be understood very carefully because uh, whatever tribological systems we talk about, either it will be dry sliding or rolling. Okay? But now the next comes lubrication which, which we will uh, discuss a little bit. The lubrication is basically separation of the two material, two solid materials, solid one and solid two by a lubricant in between. So obviously once you separate these two, the, these two are not, no more important. What is important is the liquid here in between and this liquid has got some shear property, okay, some viscosity which is given as shear stress is proportional to the shear rate. And then we give shear stress is equal to eta and gamma dot. So that means the shear property of the liquid is important. The, the faster you are trying to move, the higher the shear stress will be and therefore friction will be high. So which is friction of the lubricated contact. But in real practice, there will be a lot of contact between the two surfaces. So even though we say that the lubricant is separating the two surfaces, but the two surfaces has got some asperities, roughness. And depending upon the load, these asperities will contact each other 
and um, therefore there will be wear. So in fact in the lubricated contact also wear takes place. It is not without wear. Okay? But it is possible to actually separate them out by using hydrodynamic force and that we will understand how the hydrodynamic force can be uh, introduced so that this load can be taken care of by the hydrodynamic force or hydrodynamic pressure which is created here. So this load can be taken care of by this so that this one of the solid can be lifted up so they can be separated. So this is the principle of hydrodynamic lubrication. We were also discussing about this one how to measure uh, friction and uh, here the dynamic friction. So this is a very uh, classical way of measuring uh, coefficient of friction by making a small solid slide on an inclined plane and you first you keep the solid on this plane and then lift this inclined plane up and the moment when this starts moving is the theta here measure the angle here and the mu is simply tan of the theta so so this is the equation that proves that mu is equal to tan theta so this is a very very classical way and uh, this also gave the proof why static friction and dynamic friction uh, are not the same is because the moment it starts movement it is overcoming the static friction but the next instant of time as soon as it has started moving now it is overcoming the kinetic friction or dynamic friction which is lower so that means the friction force that is acting this direction to stop this mass is lower than w sin theta which means that there is a net force in this direction and this is the reason why once it starts movement you cannot stop it it doesn't stop it just goes accelerates and goes down until finish so so that uh, proves that static friction is lower less than kinetic friction and in fact this uh, realization or this uh, theory was given by Euler um, long back. <clears throat> now the measurement of uh, measurement of friction is um, by this method is not very practical and also it will not be true for many of the machines because when we talk about machines for example gears or, or bearings here the sliding is not just one sliding it happens many many times so it's a continuous movement continuous movement here for example this is the shaft and this is the bearing and there is a continuous movement happening here. Similarly in the case of gears there is continuous contact and uh, separation between these two surfaces. Continuous sliding taking place. So therefore to simulate this kind of behavior or this kind of situation we use a pin on this machine. So this is the pin and this is the disc and this disc will rotate this is the shaft of the disc and this is the pin pin can be circular cross section or it can be square or rectangular whatever you want okay so looking from the top view on the disc surface you will see a kind of track that will be formed because of the pin so pin is for example here and this is the track and since the disc is moving in this direction the this because of the friction this disc this pin will also tend to move this direction because the friction is trying to move it forward okay and what you do is you 
put a load cell here looking vertically so this is the load cell so load cell will stop this pin and to stop this load cell has to apply some force and that force will be measured as F friction force so this is the main principle of a, a apparatus known as pin on disc so this is very popular for all kinds of trapological tests both in the industry as well as in in research but there are other types of testers as well um, you know different variation of this test for example a flat plate on a cylindrical shaft where cylinder is moving like this so there are many many different combinations of this one and this is a multi-pass test so that means on the same track we are measuring many times so if you if you measure if you plot friction force as a function of time or sliding distance d then initially friction will will rise very very quickly and then it will start going down and more more or less this kind of behavior you will see so this is the steady state so a steady state is achieved after many number of cycles it can also be a number of cycles so after many number of cycles steady state will be achieved and that is the friction that you will report so that is the coefficient of friction divided by normal load will be coefficient of friction in some cases it is also possible that friction will continue to rise stabilize at some point but still it will show a rising trend so all kinds of possibilities are there when you do this pin on this test of uh, any material so the material you are testing you will use as pin testing material and the disc will be a standard material sometimes it is a hard material like um, bearing steel and sometimes it is stainless steel 316 this kind of hard hard steels are used as the disc so reducing or controlling friction remains the main challenge in tribology so all we do in tribology is to reduce or control coefficient of friction and by doing that we can also control wear so i will talk about wear uh, in a while and the contacts we were talking about Uh, last time are two types one is the conformal and another is non conformal so in a conformal uh, contact you have got same radius of curvature so for example flat on a flat is a conformal so here what will happen is um, the pressure will be low in non conformal for example a sphere on a flat surface here the contact pressure will be very very high so these two uh, situations are totally different in terms of pressure and because different pressure gives a different tribological response different friction different wear and therefore Uh, whether you are testing a pin against a flat surface or a ball against a flat surface you you should know that the conditions have changed one of the problem with flat or conformal surface or especially this flat on flat surface is the contact area it is very hard very difficult to maintain a good contact area because there will there will always be some sort of inclination so this pin ideally it should be parallel to this surface but 
often there will be some angle to this pin is not parallel to the uh, this plane surface and therefore the contact is only partial contact here this side is no contact so this is what you will experience when you conduct this pin on this test with a pin you will find that on the pin surface when I look on the cross section of the pin surface I will find that only partly it has been wearing out and this side it was not even touching so this is a practical problem and that you have to uh, solve by some method so that you get as maximum contact as possible but this problem doesn't exist when you have got non conformal like a sphere on a flat surface because whatever may happen there will be always a point contact so you you always good uh, take, get a good point contact sir due to sir point contact uh, rapidly we are occur sir no? uh, sorry can you say again sir, this, sir due to po point contact pressure is very high then sir we are we are is rapidly occur na no? uh, something called pitic we are i think yes so we will talk about where very soon so yes uh, because of point point contact the pressure um, so failure that means i want to say failure more yeah failure is more yes so pressure is uh, low divided by the area and since it is point contact area is very very small therefore pressure is very large in this case pressure is low and because of this point contact and high pressure the fatigue will take place and uh, wear will take place yes any uh, other question so far no uh, sir okay okay now we will see some of the data um, the typical uh, typical friction coefficient of unlubricated material so it is a dry sliding at low speeds in normal atmosphere against a mild steel counterface so counter surface has to be always defined because uh, friction as well as wear is a two material property it is not one single material property so you must always report what is the counter surface and you must always report the atmosphere what is the atmosphere so here it is a normal atmosphere and in fact another thing you should report is temperature what is the temperature but if it is not reported we assume that it is room temperature so what you see is uh, mild steel against mild steel it is 0.55 to 0.8 so it is very very high so now you can see that if we are sliding same material against same material one material against it, it itself then the coefficient of friction is very very high so this is a typical uh, behavior with all materials and therefore we should avoid this situation uh, for mild steel against aluminium against copper again very very high okay um, cadmium chromium and so on with indium it is even high um, but indium is slightly different material when it is in the thin form it does give low coefficient of friction as well so okay same with lead is high friction but again if you use lead in the thin form you can get actually low friction you can get lubrication because of lead but of course lead is uh, is a toxic material so we do not use lead for um, for our technological application but long back people used lead for some applications indium is a is a good material um, phosphor bronze so this is a bronze bronze is supposed to have low coefficient of friction and that's why many of the bearings that you you use and especially the journal bearings are made of bronze one is made of bronze another side is made of steel often the shaft will be steel and the bearing part 
the load bearing part will be the bronze brass also depends upon the alloying element uh, um, generally it is used okay. and here you can see the leaded brass that means lead has been added into the brass and it gives very low coefficient of friction so lot depends upon the alloying element so in fact for travelogical application you can select the alloying element what you want in that metal so that you can get low dry friction which is very very important for any bearing even if you are using lubrication doesn't matter you want low dry friction because the, the lubricant doesn't always work it fails many many times and therefore the dry, uh, dry sliding will always occur and then cast iron is also used as a uh, good tribological material although you see here is 0 0.4 but many of the cast irons will give you lower coefficient of friction 0 0.3 or low and similarly white metal bearing alloys um, there are many types of white metals so this gives high friction but there is another white metal which is called babit material or babit metal babit metal is a good um, bearing material it gives low coefficient of friction and non metals brakes and friction materials so brakes are supposed to have high coefficient of friction and carbon based materials the materials which has got carbon inside either uh, as a structure the molecule has got carbon or uh, carbon has been added into it so it gives low coefficient of friction but again there is a big variation so you see uh, for the same type of materials we can see lot of variation and one variation can happen between vacuum and air so some application requires uh, vacuum for example space application so space tribology when we talk about we always talk about vacuum and normal air but it can also be another kind of atmosphere it can be h2 or nitrogen or oxygen environment it is possible so in vacuum um, mu is always high and in air mu will be low for the same combination of materials and this happens because in vacuum we have less contamination so every surface has got some contamination in the form of oxide or some hydrocarbon so this contamination tends to give you low coefficient of friction so so this kind of friction that we measure actually it is not true metal inside for example if i talk about fe it is not iron but rather it is the oxide iron oxide which is on the top and it happens for all materials but when we apply vacuum uh, it is possible that ox oxides will be taken away and therefore there will be fresh metal to metal contact or at least whatever contamination is there on the surface has been taken away and therefore there is a very high adhesive interaction and they adhere to each other so for example if we talk about um, asperities and the top surface so if initially it was like this because of adhesion there will be more contact so the contact has grown from small to large contact and this is also called as junction growth or theory so that means because of the growth of the junction the friction coefficient increases so under 
different kind of situation and it happens for ductile material um, mainly for metals and polymers so whatever junction is formed the junction will grow the contact area will grow and therefore friction will be large so that means we should not take friction as a fixed value but rather it is it varies depending upon the situation so this is very very important and we should uh, we should note that so what is important to understand is adhesion plays a very very important role adhesion between two surfaces and addition takes place because of many reasons so if, when two materials have got high addition then it will give you high coefficient of friction and this is the reason why when you slide the same materials together then addition is force is high and therefore friction is is very high now plastic deformation for plastic deformation the contact pressure can be related to the shear yield strength k is the shear yield strength of the softer material by some constant like this okay depending upon the uh, the uh, depending upon the mode of uh, failure or um, failure criterion depending upon the failure criterion uh, this you can find some relation between the contact pressure and the shear yield pressure for plastic deformation but that means at this point the plastic deformation has initiated so this is for static contact but when you apply some shear or tangential force so initially static contact and now you are applying tangential force here so in that case this relation is modified as this one where p is the pressure now it is the the pressure alpha 1 constant tau is the shear stress at the interface and k is still the shear yield strength of the material alpha 2 is another constant so in order for this equation to be valid because this side is the same this is a material property k is the material property so this side has to adjust so p has to reduce in order to adjust this one okay and p can be reduced only if because normal load is fixed is is fixed so only area has to change so therefore the area has to increase to reduce p so that this equation can be valid so this just shows that when there is a sliding action uh, contact area has to increase so that means once sliding initiates the contact area will increase from the beginning from the initial contact area and therefore um, that will lead to the friction now we just again replot this equation equation 1.6 in this form as equation 1.7 here so it's the same equation but now we are plotting in the form of mu so we have done tau over p is the mu and m we define m as tau over k k is the shear yield strength of the material okay so this equation is basically re rewriting equation 1.6 and making these small changes now if you plot mu coefficient of friction as a function of m which is also known as friction factor which is basically tau over k tau is the shear stress and k is the shear yield strength of the material of the deforming material so using this equation if you plot you will find that 
when m is close to unity, close to 1, the mu rises very sharply for whatever alpha over alpha 2. So whatever value you take this one, the coefficient of friction will, large, uh, will be large when m is close to 1. And for alpha 1 over alpha 2 close to 1, the coefficient of friction is even larger, very, very high. So this is also by experimental evidence it has been found and this what it says is that m which is tau over k should not be close to unity to 1. So that means if this ratio is close to 1 coefficient of friction will be automatically high. So the shear stress and the shear yield strength of the softer material or deforming material should not be the same. So, so that means it is better if the material is stronger but the interface is weaker. That means the interface should be weak so that tau will be small and this should be strong. so that k will be large. So if k is large and tau is small, the ratio m will be close to this side and therefore coefficient of friction will be low. So this is a, a important um, relation, important to understand that in order for us to achieve low coefficient of friction, we should keep the interfacial shear stress small or weak and we should keep the, the shear yield strength of the material, the two materials strong. So often what happens is we can keep it weak either by basically by introducing something here and sometimes what we do is we add some solid lubricant here in the material. A solid lubricant which should not affect the strength of this material but since the solid lubricant will be present here at this interface it will reduce the shear stress of the interface and in some way you can also say it is like lubricating the surface which is true it is basically lubricating the surface using a solid lubricant without actually affect uh, while keeping the strength of the material high of these two materials and this has been uh, found experimentally to be true so this is one way to solve the friction problem just now i was talking about the friction in vacuum and there is an experimental data here where people conducted the test coefficient of friction as a function of time and between two metal surfaces so I, I guess it was uh, two steel surfaces so coefficient of friction was quite low in the range of 0 0.3 or so and the pump pump out apparatus that means vacuum vacuum was created so as vacuum was created the coefficient of friction started rising but it did not rise so much it rose little bit but when degassing was done degassing is basically heating heating the specimen so by heating the specimen from the surface more of the contaminants started evaporating going out so initial just vacuum may not remove all the contaminants but if you uh, increase the temperature then more of the contaminants will go out and then you can see that coefficient of friction rises very very high very sharply to value of 6 which is almost like a cold welding what is known as cold welding. So this term is also used in 
Jensen growth theory. So very very high coefficient of friction and then what they did was they introduced a trace of oxygen just little bit of oxygen and the coefficient of friction again went down to a very low value here okay? and continued like this. So again if you remove the vacuum, de-vacuum it then the coefficient of friction will come down again. So this was done quite early on 1950s and it was proved that the vacuum increases coefficient of friction and the reason is because of the removal of the contaminants from the surface. So now if we talk about travelogical design rules. Excuse me sir. Yeah. Sir, in, in vacuum region what uh, like you told about cold welding, can you explain again? Okay. So vacuum means this is the vacuum region, right? Sir, uh, how it created uh, firstly by heating then how it created? First uh, vacuum was created. So for example, if you, yes. have, if you know there are some uh, methods where Basically, it is a chamber, right? Chamber and you have got a pump here and then uh, you can run the pump and air will be sucked out so vacuum will be created, right? And let's say you have got a, your apparatus inside pin on this machine you have got inside so, so you are measuring coefficient of friction in vacuum so for some amount of vacuum you you see that friction coefficient was rising but it did, did not rise too much but now at this point what they did in this experiment uh, they heated so there was some uh, heating element coil here inside yeah and using electricity they heated the whole surface here so once they heated the surface the coefficient of friction started rising very sharply okay and this they explained is because uh, the more contaminants were taken out when we heat it. At normal temperature, even by vacuum, not all contaminants will go out. But once you heat it, you provide some energy for the contaminants to get removed. Okay? Because contaminants are sitting on the surface because of some interatomic forces, right? some interatomic forces are acting here but by applying heat energy you are basically breaking those bonds and therefore this contaminant is ready to go out and that is what happens happened here okay is it all right yes sir yes sir and the last part was when you they introduce oxygen so that means they just added some oxygen inside and then they found that the coefficient of friction started uh, decreasing considerably and then going back to the normal value when you de vacuum. So, this is sir, a. Yeah. Sir, in vacuum region, coefficient of friction is constant. How it achieved sir? this? Uh... Um, see, it is already very, very high. And uh, so, this coefficient of friction of 6 is too high so that's why I said it is like cold welding that means two surfaces have just got welded together because of this adhesion so adhesion is so strong that this is like welding you know the welding process is also like adhesion so in in welding you have got two surfaces let's say two surfaces and you want to join them together. So what you do is you introduce another material, soft yes, material, flare material. flare material, which will nearly melt, right? And then when it is very, very soft, nearly melting, then it makes a very, very strong connection with all the bonds, all the atoms they have here. And therefore it will just bond together. So in some way it is the adhesion or cohesion we can talk if it is same material then it is cohesion and if there are two different materials then it is adhesion so welding is nothing but 
addition interatomic force the interatomic force is so strong that now you cannot remove them you have to apply very very strong force to remove them so so that is welding in a normal sense when we apply heat okay but here this welding has happened because in cold condition because of the vacuum of course this heating was done but this heating was very very minimum it's not like a welding very little heating just to remove the contaminants but two surfaces got welded together in fact some of the metals will get welded together just in cold condition for example lead if two lead surfaces you press them very hard they get welded together because of this cold addition lead or even gold gold can also get welded together because of this so uh, tribological design rules so far we can write from this dry uh, dry test that one thing we have learnt is uh, similar metals should not be used similar materials let's say materials because it applies to all polymers and ceramics also should not be used for low friction here we are talking about low friction so if you are using as a bearing material so you should not use similar material or you can call same materials and another we have observed is the interfacial shear stress should be low so tau should be low with respect to the shear yield strength of the material k of the plastically deforming material so this kind of rules we can uh, observe from just understanding friction in dry condition so some people did uh, some research on this this field in 1980 ravinovich so he showed that two metals uh, relative solubility of pure metals from their binary phase diagram so sorry this part is is missing here this is just reverse so this is tungsten and this is indium and the same metals here so he found that same material for example indium against indium which is here or uh, lead against lead or tin against tin and all the way up to here is not good because they are identical materials metals that means they have a infinite solubility inside them each other so they will be soluble in each other and therefore they are not good next is one liquid phase solid solubility above 1% again this is also not good um solid solubility is quite high then another is one liquid phase solid solubility one between 1 and 0.1 next is one liquid phase solid solubility below 0.1 so this is a good so all this solid triangles parts are good tribo pairs so for example zirconium against this one let me see here this is iron so fe so this is a good pair to for sliding action of course here we have got pure metals and uh, in uh, industrial application we don't use pure metals but this gives us some indication some some good rule that if the solubility is high between two metals then we should not use them 
this is the best two liquid phases solid solution less than 0.1% lowest addition so this is good pair so we can find that copper and here we have got chromium this is chromium for example silver and fe are good so this can give us very good indication of uh, which metal against which metal is good for our uh, low friction properties so whether they are in the pure form or they are in alloy form the same rule will apply so this is known as uh, Rabinovich table and he was the first person to explain this part okay so moving on so we have covered quite a lot about friction uh, next we will consider wear so friction and wear and lubrication these three parts are very very important for us to understand so that we can deal with any kind of tribological system when we are designing the tribological system we can deal with any of them okay. and uh, as i said um, even though with lubricant wear is less but still wear does take place and with lubricant friction is less but still there is friction so we should not think that just by using lubricant we have eliminated friction and wear problem it's not true we have just reduced them but not eliminated so what is wear so wear is the process of material removal okay from a surface as a result of sliding or rolling action between two surfaces in the presence of ambient environment of thermal or chemical nature so whatever ambient environment we have the where we will call when the material is removed physically removed from the surface okay. so just deformation plastic deformation is not where after plastic deformation the material must be removed as small particles it is called wear debris written as d e b r i s but pronounced only debris we don't pronounce s and uh, singular plural is the same thing so we call it wear debris so we know that wear is extremely harmful for any kind of machine because it will damage the components so whatever bearing you have let's say a journal bearing if wear takes place it will not work anymore because there will be huge amount of vibration between the shaft and the bearing part and because of this vibration though even the wear rate will go up and whole of the machine may fall may fail by fatigue process so although the machine failed by fatigue but the originator was wear because of the wear so root cause always we try to find out root cause of any kind of failure any kind of engineering failure so root cause is often wear so wear uh, can um, damage the component uh, the replacement cost you have to do machine uh, downtime for example a bearing fails so then the machine has to be stopped and that will uh, have cost and then if you talk about industrial uh, sector then loss of production and loss of business opportunities because during that fail uh, failure or maintenance time some other business could have happened so it's a huge loss and in fact in 1966 uh, some committee did a, a very big survey and they found that almost 1.4% of the GDP 
gross domestic product of a nation is lost because of wear or we can call it because of tribology and in 1966 in that report that report is known as Jost report Jost was the name of the person who headed that committee and he he was the person who reported this fact that 1.4 percent of the nation's GDP GDP is lost and he gave the the term tribology so tribology is being used since 1966 before 1966 this word wasn't there so we did not use tribology but of course the problem of friction and wear were always there you know we, we cannot uh, the wear problem did not start from 1966 it was always there but in 1966 Jost report put together all of them as tribology so since then we study tribology and under tribology we study friction wear and lubrication and other aspects of tribology so this is the origin origin of the word tribology so now the wear process uh, is influenced just like friction by external factors affecting where are the interfacial friction so the friction is very very important friction will affect wear the mechanical stress that means the load whatever load you are applying and if you increase the load the wear may change in a unexpected way then relative speed the relative speed will cause even temperature to rise so because of temperature so which is here interfacial temperature then any kind of uh, chemical environment species is there either as solid liquid or as gaseous phase that will also affect so these are all the factors and there can be more factors which will affect where whenever two surfaces are sliding against each other it happens in the rolling also because in the rolling there is a, some amount of sliding also going on whether you are talking about ball bearing journal bearing or gears in all cases some sliding will take place and there are some types of wear which for which um, sliding doesn't have to happen still wear will take place which just now we were talking about fatigue wear So what fatigue wear generally happens in the rolling element, uh, rolling element machine components. So wear is normally um, reported as the volume of the material removed because there is a removal of the material, so we can call it uh, volume of the material removed, which is proportional to the normal load W, whatever normal load, the sliding distance D, and the hardness hardness of generally we talk about hardness of the wearing body so whichever material is wearing out so that means the amount of material removed or the volume of material removed is proportional to the normal load so as you increase the normal load the volume will increase as you increase um, d the distance travel obviously the volume will increase and as you increase the hardness the volume will decrease so this is a general rule not applicable to all kinds of materials but for most of the materials most of the engineering materials this rule applies so if we remove the proportionality constant and we make it equal then we give a k as the proportionality constant and k is known as wear coefficient so we can write wear coefficient in the form of VH over WD and this is also known as Archer's equation because it was Archer who actually gave this relation proportionality relation he said that 
the wear volume should be inversely proportional to the harness and proportional to the normal load and the sliding distance. So this is a very very useful equation for wear. So now if we want to compare two materials we can find out the wear coefficient just like, just like we were talking about friction coefficient now we have got a wear coefficient and this units of k is actually not there so it is dimensionless so this is a dimensionless number if you work out the dimensions you will find that they cancel out so it is dimensionless and uh, it is known as wear coefficient so we can compare wear performance of many materials by comparing their wear coefficients but we should know that the wear will depend upon so many factors so therefore the all the factors must be same if you are trying to compare now when we talk about wear coefficient we always need the hardness hardness value and it is said that hardness value may not be always available when you are conducting a wear test so what has been done is k has been divided by h so now we have got v divided by w d so if we take talk about units volume we keep it in millimeter cube and this is newton and distance is meter this is just a convenient way of talking about this factor because where volume is always very very small so it is practical to keep it in millimeter and sliding distance is always very large uh, yeah in the equation uh, that we have this d, d, the displacement or the distance that uh, it is the distance traveled by the point of load or uh, where the uh, w will be acting yes so uh, let's say in pin on this machine if we talk and this is the pin and we are rotating so every revolution we are traveling 2 pi r right if this is the r yes, yes. then 2 pi sorry, r sorry. we are traveling every uh, every revolution right so we just count the number of revolution yes, yes. it made in a, in a certain time right so that is the distance is that the answer yes sir right so we can always use wear coefficient but as i said h is sometimes not available for us so we re, uh, make it a ratio of q over h and we represent like this which is given as mmq per new, newton meter sliding distance the normal load the wear volume and this term is known as a specific wear rate sometimes SWR or sometimes WS whatever you use and please use this uh, dimension millimeter cube over Newton meter not meter cube here and this is just to show that wear volume is much smaller than the sliding distance here. generally there are two ways of reporting wear either as wear coefficient or as specific wear rate but this is more common more common to report as specific wear rate but of course coefficient is also used excuse me sir yeah sir some of the process like uh, milling and grinding where, where also material removal occurs sir but where where, where we not say this is where or unfavorable for us right so, so you know in cutting process um, uh, grinding process actually our purpose is to remove the material right so for example in the machining process you are trying to remove material from here 
by using some tool here so so you do not say where is taking place because this where was actually intended you wanted to remove the material but process is the same it is a where process and it is done exactly the same way as you deal with other kinds of where situation but here rather we talk about where of the tool right tool where you must have heard about right yes yes sir. tool where and there are equations to to calculate the tool where so tool where we talk about because this is the part the tool which we want to save okay we want to save we don't want to lose the tool so therefore we talk about tool where we don't talk about the wear of the material where, rather we talk more like a material remover how much material we have removed so just it's the term terminology but the process is the same and whatever you learn about wear and friction you can apply to this one to make this process more efficient okay so because in the cutting process or any kind of manufacturing process our main goal is to save the tool and make the process very fast make the material removal process very very fast so how can we make it fast at the same time we can protect the tool from wearing out so the same type of uh, understanding about wear and friction we can use in the manufacturing process so tribology in the manufacturing is is also uh, equally applicable but just the, the way we look at it is slightly different when we are talking about bearing in that case we want to save the bearing we don't want to uh, remove the bearing okay uh, or lose the bearing so there we talk about where is taking place whereas in the material process uh, material uh, manufacturing process we talk about material removal and tool wear is that okay yes yes okay. yes yes sir. yeah so today uh, i would like to just stop here we have already gone into the uh, next hour uh, so do you have any question any further question no sir no so uh, i'm taking a lot of time to uh, make you understand about friction and wear and lubrication we will talk about lubrication the as i have said before uh, these are the fundamentals the basics and often people do not understand the basics and therefore we just talk about different uh, equations and theory and models but we don't understand the basics basics includes a lot of physics and a lot of chemistry as well um, because once we understand these basics we can apply this to any kind of tribological system designing uh, whether you are designing bearings or designing brake materials or seal materials in all cases it will be applicable so so this is the way we will follow in this uh, course